in our country, but probably throughout most of the world. Have you ever thought these thoughts or heard them? Let's see if I can get this mic in the right spot. I guess it's okay. <laughs> Have you ever heard this or thought of this? I guess not okay. <laughs> All right. I'm tired of being a slave. I just want freedom. I want to control my own destiny. You ever heard thoughts like that? You ever thought thoughts like that? Freedom of choice is something that's important to most of us. It's something that really is a founding principle of the country that we live in. That's why the pilgrims came here to start with, was freedom of choice. But choice depends on knowing what the options are. You can't choose unless you know what you're choosing between. For example, when you go to a restaurant, uh, the first thing that you usually, or, or shortly after you get there, is hand you a menu. Here's your choices. Here's what you can pick between. And you look down through, and, and usually you find something there that, that you're looking for. But choices depend on knowing what the options are. So what you need to ask when you hear the questions, tired of being a slave, I just want freedom. I want to control my own destiny, is freedom from what? A slave to what? destiny end up where? Let's look in Romans chapter 6. Paul addresses these questions in Romans 6, 15 through 23. So we'll read down through this passage and then we'll come back and take it apart a little bit. Romans chapter 6, verse 15, on to the end of the chapter. Right before this, uh, Paul has been talking about sin and grace saying that you're now not under the law, but under grace. So then verse 15, What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness? But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as you have yielded your members, servants to uncleanness, and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members, servants to righteousness unto holiness. For when you were the servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. What fruit had you then in those things whereof you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now, being made free from sin and become servants to God, you have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. There's three questions in here that... that Paul asks or answers. And I want, I want to note what the options are in here. They're an either-or kind of question. It's not a wide-open thing. It's either-or. The first one is, what do you want to be free from? What do you want to be free from? Verse 18 talks about being made free from sin. Being then made free from sin, you become servants of righteousness. And then in verse 20, it's the opposite. For when you are servants of sin... You are free from righteousness. So there's two choices there. What do you want to be free from? On the one hand, you can be free from sin, or you can be free from righteousness. The second question is, what will I serve? And we saw that in these same two verses. You have two choices of what to serve. You can serve sin, or you can serve righteousness. Now note that, that those two questions are interconnected. You can't pick what you want out of both of them. They, they go together. And then the third question, where will I end up? Verse 21, what fruit had you in these things that you're now ashamed of? For the end of those things is death. If you choose sin, you end up in death, in eternal death. And then verse 22, now being made free from sin, become servants to God, you have fruit unto holiness, and the end, everlasting life. So you can focus on any one of these three questions. What do I want to be free from? 
Do I want to be free from sin or free from righteousness? Or you can look at what do I want to serve? Do I want to serve righteousness or serve sin? It's like if I serve righteousness, I'm free from sin. If I serve sin, I'm free from righteousness. Or you can look at the bottom line, where am I going to end up? Do I want to end up with eternal life? That is serving righteousness, being free from sin. Do I want to end up with eternal death? That's the result of serving sin, being free from righteousness. Look back just a little bit further back at verse 13 of Romans 6. It says, Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Note there again, there's only two options. It doesn't ask, are you going to yield? Paul says, who will you yield to? You will yield to God, or you will yield to unrighteousness. Oftentimes, when we think, I want the freedom of choice, or I want to be free, we forget to take it that one step further and say, free from what? What does that really mean? What will I be free from? Or what will I yield to? That's the question. Let's switch gears now and go to another passage in uh, Psalms. Psalm chapter 23, verse 6. Now for many of you, this is probably a familiar passage. The shepherd's psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The end of that is where I want to focus. David says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. What does it mean to follow? I hadn't really thought of this before. It says God's goodness and mercy will follow me. What does follow mean? There's, it's kind of a wide word in the English language. You could say, so you could tell somebody, sure, you can follow me. You know, I'm going here, you're welcome to follow. And that's a, a pretty loose, pretty light meaning of follow. You're not paying a lot of attention to them. If they follow, that's great. If they don't, you're lost. You, know, you follow if you can. That's one way it's used. Another way is much more intense. Might be, somebody might say, he's following me. Now that's a pretty, a pretty uh, intentional following. And it's, they're determined. <clears throat> the Hebrew word here that is translated follow Follow is probably not the best choice for this word. The word is radaf. And most of the places in the Old Testament where radaf is used, it's more often translated pursue rather than follow. In fact, almost every single time in the Old Testament where the word pursue occurs in, in your Bible, it comes from this word, from radaf. So anytime it talks about pursuing, it's this word. And then it's also translated follow, chase, a number of different things as well. Let's go through uh, some texts that use this word, some of the stories where it's used. I think it'll give us a, a better glimpse of what that word means. The first one is in Genesis chapter 14. Genesis 14, verse 14. This is the story of the capture of Lot. Remember that Lot was taken prisoner. The uh, army came and took him and his, his whole family captive. Abram heard about it and came to the rescue. Uh, Genesis 14, 14, and probably on through 16. When Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his trained servants, born in his own house, 318, and pursued them unto Dan. That word pursued there is radaf, the same word that we're talking about. He pursued them, and look at the result. He divided himself against them, he and his servants by night, and smote them and pursued them, there's the word again, unto Hobah, which is on the left hand of Damascus. And he brought back all the goods, and also brought back again his brother Lot, and his goods, and the women also, and the people. Abraham finished the job. He pursued, but he didn't just chase him for little ways. He chased until he caught him, and he got back everything that he set out to get. That's what that word means. Another example in Genesis 44, this is the story of Joseph in Egypt. Genesis 44, verse 4. So Joseph is now the second in command in Egypt, next only to the king. And his brothers have come to him to buy grain. He sold them the grain. They didn't know who he was. 
he had the money put back in their sack and sent them home. Right after that, verse 4 of chapter 44, when they were gone out of the city and not yet far off, Joseph said to his steward, Up, follow after the men. There's that word, follow, radaf. Follow after the men. And when you do overtake them, say to them, Why have you rewarded evil for good? If the second command of the country, who could pretty much do anything he wanted to do, told you, follow those men, what kind of follow would that be? That wouldn't be a half-hearted, well, come back and tell them, you know, I got hungry, so I, I turned around. Or it got kind of dusty, or the way was hard, or I wasn't sure which way they went. No, if he said follow, you would follow until one, you caught them, or two, there was just flat, no way you could do it. And then you'd be looking for some other option besides going back and saying, I couldn't do the job. That's what, that's what this word, radaf, that's, that's what it means. Follow, there are no other options, nothing else you can do. We see it again in Exodus chapter 14, the story of the Red Sea, verses 4, 8, 9, 23, again and again and again through this story, the Egyptians are pursuing or following the children of Israel. How dedicated were the Egyptians to catching those people? Same thing, the king had said go and they were going to go. And they followed them right down in the middle of the ocean, which some people probably would stop at that point and go, no, that doesn't look like where I want to go. No. Radoff, they were pursuing, they were following to the end, to what it, whatever it took to get the job done. We see it again in Joshua, Joshua chapter 8, verse 24. This is the story of conquering the city of Ai. You'll remember that after Jericho, the people were feeling so good about what they'd done, they says, hey, we're on a roll, let's keep going. Let's go get this next city, and by the way, it's a little one, it's not that important, we don't all need to go, let's go do it. They didn't ask God, met with disaster. They were defeated, which they thought, now what? When words gets out about this, we are in trouble. Turns out, they had messed up. There was sin in the camp. Achan had taken things he shouldn't have taken. Once that was straightened around and God dealt with that, he sent them back. He says, now you're ready to go to Ai, to this other city. I want you all to go, and you're going to be victorious. So in uh, verse 24, and this is the same word is used throughout this story as well, but we'll look at verse 24. Whoops, wrong book. Joshua 8, 24. It came to pass when Israel had made an end of slaying all the inhabitants of Ai in the field, in the wilderness where they chased them, and when they were all fallen on the edge of the sword until they were consumed, that all the Israelites returned to Ai and smote it with the edge of the sword. Note here again that they did the job until it was finished. They chased, the word here chased is that same word ravaf. They chased them until they were consumed. There were no more to chase. The chasing was done because there weren't any more to chase. And then they went back to town, finished the job there. Two more examples. One is 1 Samuel, and here's not a specific verse, but chapter 23, 25, and 26 is the stories again and again of Saul chasing after David. And remember, he chased him all over the place, and he wouldn't quit. He'd quit for a little bit. He'd say, oh, God, you're right. I shouldn't be doing this. David, I'm sorry. You're back reestablished into, into where your position of a good position. I'm going to go back and rule the kingdom. And before you know it, Saul is right back again, chasing him again to another spot. And he just he couldn't give it up. It was like an obsession. The word that's used there for chase or pursue all the way through those stories is this same word, radaf. He just he couldn't quit. He wouldn't quit no matter what. And then again in Psalm 18, Psalm 1837. David says, I have pursued my enemies and overtaken them. Neither did I turn again until they were consumed. So David says, I pursued, I read off. The result of that was I didn't stop until they were gone. So let's take those thoughts back to Psalm 23.6. God's goodness 
and his mercy will follow us, will pursue us, will chase us, and never stop. All the days of our lives, God is pursuing us with everything he has, everything, and he's not going to quit. And note the result for David. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. David says that's the result. God is pursuing me. His mercy, his goodness is pursuing me forever, all my life, and I will spend eternity with him. That's the result of God's pursuit combined with David's choice. A couple of other stories where we can see this same thing at work. Think of Adam and Eve in the garden. When they sinned, their natural reaction was to hide from God. That's what they did. They ran away and hid. His natural reaction was to call them and to go find them, to pursue. That's what God does. When we mess up, we want to run and hide, cover our face, plug our ears, just get away. God's reaction to that is to call us, to come and find us. And then Matthew chapter 13. Matthew 13 has a lot of illustrations about the kingdom of heaven. It says the kingdom of heaven is like, and there's many, many examples that it gives in that chapter. The kingdom of heaven is like a sower, a man that went out to plant seed. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. It goes, it goes on and on. The ones that we want to look at are verse 44 and 45. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in a field, which when a man has found it, he hides it, and for joy goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Now these two examples, the first one, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure. We're pretty comfortable with that and we're pretty familiar with that thought. The kingdom of heaven is worth giving all that we have to get. Sell everything you've got, everything. Give everything up, get it, and man, you've got the deal of your life. But look at the second one with the pearl merchant. It says the kingdom of heaven is like the merchant, not the pearl. The kingdom of heaven is like the merchant who sold everything he had to buy the pearl. We're the pearl. God gave everything he had for us. That's a little different approach, a little different thought that I hadn't picked up on before. God is pursuing us. He's chasing after us. God wants you. He's chasing you with the same determination that we see in these stories. He's chasing you like an army chasing after victory, that he is not going to stop until the job is done. Like a servant on command from the ruler of the empire, God is not going to stop pursuing us. A lot of times we get the idea that the devil is after us, and he certainly is. We've experienced that enough that, that we usually don't have too much struggle with that. He's chasing us. He's out to get us. And so the devil is after us, and on the other side, God is willing to take us if we make the choice to come to him, the freedom of choice, and we surrender, and we obey, and sometimes we make the list longer and longer and longer. If we make the effort, God is there. This isn't the picture that I'm seeing painted. We still have the freedom of choice, yes. We still have to surrender, definitely. But isn't it easier to surrender to somebody that wants you that bad? That's not a difficult thing. God is chasing you. He wants you. And he wants you so bad, he will do anything. Look at Philippians. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. And look here at the position of Jesus, what he was willing to do. Philippians chapter 2, 5 through 8. And think of, think of his position. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. So he started out, he's equal with God. That's about the highest position you possibly could get. But made himself of no reputation. Took on him the form of a servant. So no reputation. 
a servant, was made in the likeness of men. That's getting pretty bad. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, lower yet, and became obedient unto death, lower yet, even the death of the cross. The lowest, most humiliating, most awful death that you could experience. So think of that. Jesus started out equal with God, made himself of no reputation, made into the likeness of men, humbled himself, obedient to death, death of the cross. There is nothing that God wouldn't do to get to us. That's how much he wanted us. So the question I have for you is, who will you choose? 1 Peter 5.8 says, Satan is walking about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Satan is chasing. He's looking to eat you up. God is pursuing you too. His goodness and his mercy is chasing you. Remember in Romans 6, you either yield to sin or you yield to God. Which one are you going to yield to? Which one are you going to choose? There's a poem that I've always, always uh, enjoyed, I guess. It speaks to, to my heart. It's called The Road Not Taken by Robert Frost. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood, and sorry, I could not travel both and be one traveler. Long I stood and looked down one far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth. Then took the other, just as fair, and having perhaps the better claim, because it was grassy and wanted wear. Though, as for that, the passing there had worn them really about the same. And both that morning, equally late in leaves, no step had trodden black. Oh, I kept the first for another day. Yet, knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh. Somewhere, ages and ages hence, two roads diverged in the wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. What road are you taking? Remember in this poem, there appeared to be little difference between the two, but you may never be coming back. You may only take one road. Remember the three questions that we started out with? Determine your answer to the question that resonates inside of your heart. Which question do you relate to the best? You've only got to answer one. Who will you serve? What will you be free from? Or where will you end up? If you answer one, the other two are automatically taken care of. It determines the road that you're going to take. Remember, God is pursuing you. He's not going to stop all the days of your life. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we ask this morning that you will help us to see clearly the choices that you lay in front of us, that it's really pretty simple. Who will we choose? Who will we serve? Or what will we be free from? Or where are we going to end up? And help us, Lord, to experience, to see, to understand that you are pursuing us, that you're going to do everything it takes to catch us, to deliver us. We thank you for that, and we ask for your strength as we travel down the road. In Jesus' name.